Well, good morning, everyone. Um, do you ever have times where you feel um, you need to do something and you need to do it, I don't know, maybe, maybe a, uh, a sense of urgency? I find that uh, the older I get, the more urgent I become with some things. And, uh, time is marching on and uh, I get expectations on myself, so to speak, the older I get. And I have that sense of urgency when I'm at work. I mean, my wife and I have been blessed to be in vocational ministry that is Christian ministry for quite a few years now. And so while it's in the job description, we didn't need the job description to share the gospel, share the hope that is within us. We have the freedom and the expectation at our full-time work to do that very thing. But my sense of urgency seems to be at its peak, at its highest, at its most intense level when I think of the local church. Because when I think of the local church, uh, the thing that comes to mind is uh, how do we spend our time? How urgent are we living? Uh, I'm going to say something that I suspect you know, but it's always good to be reminded. The world's way of living life does not work. Okay? It doesn't work. A worldview that is adopted from the perspective that the world gives us is very counter to how the church is called to live. Quite frankly, and it's a hard word, harsh word, but as uh, I guess it makes it clear, I hate it when the church looks and acts so much like the world that the distinction is impossible to see. And sometimes even the church can't see it. And I find that my mood or my, my sense of urgency changes, and it's in direct proportion to my time in our Father's Word. Less time here, a little less urgent. Maybe act a little more like the world I'm not supposed to act like. More time in here, I get urgent. I get very urgent and I don't even want to smell like the worldview that's out there, that system that would love to permanently disable the Christian in his effectiveness. Folks, we need to get, and we need to embrace, and we need to maintain a biblical perspective on reality. Embrace life with eternity, destiny, in the full view. Not on what the world considers worthy of my interest and my attentions. This morning, please open your Bible to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, written by a man who is in need of getting his worldview, not maybe not arranged, but rearranged, needing reminded of what he has known to be true because he's in danger of drifting. Drifting from where he knows he needs to be, but drifting from where he should be and isn't. So by way of application for all of us, if the emotions and the struggles that are evident to the writer of Psalm 73, if those emotions aren't yours today, then I'm going to say you can praise the Lord. But maybe they have been yours in the past. Maybe they will be 
Maybe they're yours today. But whatever the case is, I think we all need a good reminder of a biblical reality uh, from Psalm 73 today. It's one thing to... It's one thing to get biblical in our life. It's quite another to stay there. Frankly, that's, that's the call on the Christian every day of his life. Psalm 23, And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To dwell in the house of the Lord, you have to dwell in the word of the Lord and to do so forever. Let's pray, and let's start in verse 1 of Psalm 73 this morning. Father, thank you for your word and for those of uh, your servant Asaph. As we open your word, seeking fresh application of a beautiful text and how it will apply even to all of us here on this hour, on this day. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 73, let me start by reading verses 1 and 2. Asaph writes this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. So what's going on here? I, I would suggest that what's going on here is exactly what happens to many a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. A little doubt has slipped in. Now, is God good to you? Go like this. He is. He's good even when circumstances aren't good. And we know what bad circumstances are like. But God stays good. He's good. And we know it. I know it. You know it. You know, you set your eyes on the author and perfecter of faith. And you know, you begin to drown in the abundant truth of how good God truly is. But Asaph... His walk has hit a troublesome point here. Verse 2 could literally read like this. My steps were caused to slip. His faith was shaken. And his faith was shaken because he took his eyes off of eternity. And his eyes were allowed to be distorted because he looked out instead of up. Now, let me read verses 3 to 9 to you and follow along. See if you can tell where Asaph's focus was and where it should be. Psalm 73, pick it up in verse 3, reading down through verse 9, he writes this. Because I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death. And their body is fat. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Did you notice? Where is his focus at this point? Well, again, he's, he's looking out. He's seeing a lot of things. He saw this, that, this, and that, and he's not looking up at this point. What is it he sees? Well, he sees a lot of things that he thinks he wants. Verse 3, he's seeing a prosperity that provides satisfaction. Verse 4 and 5, he sees a, a lack of struggle all the way to the end of life. Verse 6 and 7, a manner of living that always gets what it wants. 
I'm glad, personally, that I don't always get what I want. Folks, my wanter is broke, but God's not. Interesting. There's a young man living at the shelter where I work. He's a Hispanic man. His first name is Wanter. My wanter is broke. I don't always know what I should want, but God does. And if I want what I ought not want, he's so good to stop it. And then verses 8 and 9, it seems that what he sees, he thinks he wants, he wants influence, a, a platform, a platform that gets its way any day, says what it wants without the consequences of saying it. Power, power that appears to have no end or tether on it to control it. So, what's wrong with that picture? Well, we could talk a lot about what's wrong with that picture. But when you look at success of the world apart from their acknowledging God, or without looking at it through the lens of a biblical worldview, here's the biggest problem with it. You're settling for too little. That's really what's happening. We limit our perspective, and our emotions can lead us to very poor judgment. For example, look back at verse 4. He says, there is no pain in their death. Well, how does he know that? That's emotion, isn't it? Now, obviously, they weren't starving to death, but how did he know that death held no pain for prosperous persons? That's just not the case, is it? But emotions will do that, won't they? We run with a little bit of information, and it can explode into something we believe to be true. But see, he's forgot. Forgot something about death. Death is an enemy to those who deny God, to the godless. Man strives to hold on to life as long as he possibly can. Listen, he doesn't want to die. But the reality is this. Death is the door necessary for the twice born to go home. I'm not dragging this body with me. I'm glad I'm leaving it behind. But this body's got to die before I get to go home. As somebody once said, it was a little controversial the first time I heard it for me, and I had to really think on it before I recognized I believed it to be true. I'll throw it at you. That's not good to do something like this in your first month, I don't think. <laughs> You do not have a soul. Folks, you are a soul. You have a body. You are a soul that has a body. And that body that God has blessed each of us with must live its life out before you can leave it and go to heaven and embrace your new one. We don't have souls. We are souls. That's who we are. For the redeemed person who has set aside destiny, eternity, and is being influenced by the shallow existence of the world's perspective on things, what can potentially happen to them if they don't return to where they ought to be? Folks, the potential is they could go too far and join them. Picking it back up in verse 10, follow along, verse 10 through verse 14. Now, the first word of the New American Standard is, therefore. And uh, always remember, when you see the word therefore in Scripture, ask yourself, what is therefore, therefore? <laughs> therefore, as a result of what he has just concluded, listen to this. Therefore, his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Verse 12, behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they have increased in wealth. 
Surely, in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Verse 14, I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Now, Asaph, he's not gone down that path yet, but he's watching as others of God's children do. They've weighed their decision on a scale, but the scale's broken, and they don't know it's broken. And off they go. Personally, for me, it's kind of hard to tell in the text whether it pulled them in or they plunged in willingly or a little bit of both. But the bottom line is this. There they go. He's seeing it right before his eyes. There they go. They function on the limits of their physical senses and they're walking by sight, not by faith. Notice their reasoning in verse 11. It's like, if, if I can't see God, well, he probably can't see me. And if he can't see me, then he doesn't know what I'm doing. So I can probably get away with it. Hmm. They justify their decisions by rationalizing. It's as if they might say something like this. Yeah, I know these are the wicked who do not have any regard toward God. And I know they're going down a bad path, but I want a piece of the action. I've kept my heart pure too long. I've wasted my time. In fact, following after God has really been a bane more than it has been a blessing. Folks, that's a really dangerous place to be because there's no guarantee you'll come back. Anybody know somebody who professed to be a Christian once upon a time and you'd never know it today? Folks, never doubt God can do a miracle. But the reality is this. Many a person goes down that road way too long and it's pretty tough to return. Honestly, a secular worldview is pretty short-sighted perspective. It's small-minded to leave eternity out of our rationale. Folks, eternity is a really long time. We can't leave it out. Now, while Asaph, he's making some pretty troubling evaluations, it doesn't seem he's apparently plunged in like the others. But here's the deal. Most everybody who's gone down that road and hasn't come back, they didn't think they were going to go down there either. When you're surrounded by a worldview and those who embrace that worldview that refuses to acknowledge God, folks, that'll press on you. And it will squeeze you into its mold. As the Apostle Paul warned the Romans to avoid in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Howard Hendricks, longtime professor at Dallas Seminary, used to say this. He said, 90% of the will of God can be found from your neck up. If you know what God wants you to do, do it, is his point. Look at Asaph's struggle, verses 15, 16, and 17. Verse 15, if I had said, I'll speak like them, i speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children, referring to God. Verse 16, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then... I perceived their end. He struggled to understand what was happening before him, what he was seeing with his own eyes, until he brought God back into his worldview. Then, 
Aha. He woke up. You heard in the news this thing called woke culture? Guess what? He just woke up. He woke up. He woke up from his theological nap. He not only woke up, he wised up because now he looked up. Now looking out, he's now looking up. And in his wised up, woke up state, look at his new point of view in verses 18, 19, and 20. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. Now remember... Remember what he thought was a foregone truth earlier, verses 4 and 5? Let me reread that to you. He says, There's no pain in their death. Their body is fat. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. <coughs> Folks, he knows better. He knows that isn't true. Think about those words. No pain in their death. They are not plagued like mankind. Folks, that's nothing but sheer emotion, anger, and jealousy driving the man. The arrogant, the well-fed, the prosperous, they're not getting out alive. Billy Graham said it better than anybody I've ever heard say it. It's the ultimate statistic one out of every one is going to die, including the arrogant, including the proud. There is an eternity, and there is a God of eternity to reckon with. Now, Asaph, Asaph not only woke up regarding what was true of those in rebellion against God, but he also woke up in another very important area, himself. If you're familiar with uh, the Andy Griffith show, as uh, my wife would tell you, oh my, is he ever familiar with, especially the first four black and white years. Barney Five had a bad case of, he had no self-awareness, let's put it that way. Asaph, for a brief time, didn't, but he's woke up particularly concerning himself. Look at verse 21. He said, When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you, you being capital, before God. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand with your counsel you will guide me, and afterward receive me into glory. Now, that's a real, live, honest statement of conviction, confession, and contrition. And that's a really good place for the follower of the Creator and Savior of the world to return to if he's walked away from it. And he has walked back to it now. He's returned to the only place the twice-born belong. And it takes this transition to get away from the world's view of life. Listen, the world lives for now because that is all they have and the best that their worldview can offer. That's it. God's seemingly harsh slap in the face, is what the world needs. Would you agree? But I would suggest that prescription is so needed for many who even claim the second birth. How a child of God can consistently live and consistently function apart from a biblical worldview, frankly, that's beyond me. I don't really understand it. But it's beyond anybody Believer included, 
if time in this book is rare or irregular. I'm thankful that you're in it with me today. But let me say very bluntly, if this is the only time of the week you're in it, you're not doing yourself any justice. Because tomorrow's just as important as today. And Tuesday is Monday. And down the week. Did you see when the transition took place for Asaph? Verse 17, he says, I came into the sanctuary of God. Folks, you know what happens when you let God in? He comes in. He does. Verses 25 to 28, which closes the hymn, the psalm, is a beautiful statement of a biblically healthy worldview that has eternity, destiny, purpose, calling in view that does not limit God or themselves to the created that will one day be destroyed. Let me read 25 through 28. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Let me ask you, based on verse 25, who in heaven do you have? Maybe better to say, who in heaven has you? The God in heaven who created the universe, who really is too big to dwell in it, has chosen in his sovereign wisdom to live within you if you are born again. And if you are born again, the day you became born again is the day the Spirit of God moved inside you, set up residency at that moment. Verse 25 what is there on earth that could be desired more than God? I think it's fair to be fair. When my wife drives into the hood every day, I desire a good running car for her. Okay? I desire that. Wouldn't you? Ladies, when you're moving from point A to point B down the road, isn't it good to know that your old or new jalopy has got one more trip in it. Indeed. And I understand that. We, we, we need things. We do. But could all of us say that maybe a time is coming when maybe we need to loosen our grip on all of it just a little bit so it doesn't control us quite so much? Reflecting on verses 26 and 27, you do know these bodies are going to die one day. God strengthens, is with us forever when you trust Christ. And he does draw to a close the arrogant, the proud, and those who choose to deny God. Now, isn't that foolish to deny the existence of God? Isn't that foolish? It's terribly foolish. Now, I know you're all way too young to remember this. When the Russian cosmonauts made that first lap around the Earth. Right? You're all too young for that, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> well, they had uh, some sort of a press conference after they landed, fished him out of the water, and brought him before the cameras. And among many things, they said, we have been to space and we have not seen God. 
All they had to do was open the door. They'd have seen him then. That's all it would have took. <laughs> and finally, in our four-verse biblical worldview statement of verses 25 to 28, can you think of a more beautiful verse than verse 28? I'm reading it from the New American Standard Bible, and it goes like this. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Folks, that's intimacy. Verse goes on to say, I have made the Lord God my refuge. That's security. That I might tell of all your works. That's duty. The believer's intimacy, security, and duty in one beautiful verse. If you've ever been tempted to throw in the towel and say, sorry God, this living for Jesus is just too tough for me. Consider the reality of such a thought and how foolish it is. God does not take lightly light commitment. Listen. He wants all of you. And he wants all of all of you. We need to surrender. Surrender to him. If you want the fullness of God. And, and saved or not, the born again person can live life just like an unborn again person. Can't they? They can. Now, Lord willing, the Spirit is crushing their heart with conviction, but they have the freedom to live like it doesn't matter, and we see it all the time. But if you're a saved person, who wants to ride below the radar of a God who gave everything he had when he gave his son to rescue you from your sin? Ladies and gentlemen, I opened with it, I'll close with it. The world's system does not work. God is faithful if he's not your portion. Why not today make him your portion? Now that's a funny statement, make him your portion. You know what that means? If Jesus Christ is not your Savior, now Asaph would have known nothing of that name, Jesus Christ. But God's promise to Asaph is the same as today. God saved Esau based on the blood of Christ that would one day be spilt if he trusted in God and believed what God said to be true. Ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is so crystal clear to you and I today. You come to him by faith. He keeps the same promise he did in the Old Testament. Makes you his own. But he does that. He does 100% of the saving once a person does the believing. In Christ, in Christ alone. We need a biblical grip on life. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for the convicting words of your word and what it means to know you, to follow you, to stay near you so that this world will not pull us from you. Father, thank you for your Spirit's work, who convicts, who guides, who leads. And Father, thank you for the future and the hope that awaits us. In Jesus' name, amen.